Hi, my name is Scott, the Miniature Maniac, and in this video, I'm gonna show you my new favorite miniature war game. This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. More on them later. What up, mini family? I've been playing miniature war games for a long time, since I was 12 years old. I'm 29, and no, this is not my mom's basement. In 2004, I started out with the Lord of the Rings Miniature War Game, or as it's called now, the Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game. I moved on to both Warmer Fantasy and Warmer 40k soon thereafter in 2005. In 2009, the hobby and I became a little distant because I was more interested in trying to charm girls with my World of Warcraft t-shirts. It didn't work. Between then and 2014, I dabbled in the hobby painting miniatures mostly, but only here and there. I came back around 2015, re-entering the GW ecosphere with Age of Sigmar. Later on in 2017, I discovered Guild Ball and played that alongside AOS up until this point. There are a lot of other smaller war games like Shadow War, Armageddon, Warhammer, Underworlds, and Aetherium. 10 points to Gryffindor if you've ever heard of that game before. But the games I showed you earlier were the pillars of my hobby. Before my hobby hiatus, I was playing games virtually every week, and after the break, I played games maybe yearly. I've always wondered why this was the case, as it's a part of the hobby that I love, but that's probably a topic for another video. Recently, I've discovered the miniature war game called A Song of Ice and Fire, and I am obsessed. In the last two weeks, I've played six games of it, which heretofore was unimaginable. I played this game on the floor like a 12 year old, except instead of having the physical infallibility of a 12 year old, sitting on the floor as a 29 year old caused some back issues. I have stayed up until the wee hours of the night gaming and I've even rended my flesh finding opportunities to play this game. True story. <coughs> I first played A Song of Ice and Fire at Adepticon in 2019 and while I was intrigued, I typically write games off that are based in a lore that the game publisher does not own. In this case, the book series popularized by the show Game of Thrones. My reasoning here is that eventually the game will run out of content to make because the book series will stop progressing. Some may argue that it already has stopped, but you know what? You take your time, George. I may not read it when it comes out because I like reading books as much as an eight-year-old likes eating broccoli, but if it means creating additional content for the game that I'm playing right now, I'm in. So why? Why am I enjoying it so much? The first thing that captured my attention was the subject matter of the miniatures. I've had GW Vision on for the last however many years, and I've been slowly brainwashed into thinking that this is the only version of fantasy that exists. And while it is very freaking cool, I forgot that I also love low fantasy. Low fantasy in this context refers to a subject matter that is more realistic for the time period and less supernatural in scope. In this case, that means the miniatures in A Song of Ice and Fire. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna abbreviate that. A-S-O-I-A-F, A-S-O-I-A-F, A-S-O-I, actually screw it, I'll just say A Song of Ice and Fire. In this game's case, that means the miniatures are medieval, which I am very into. Look at this awesome archer concept, or this halberdier, or this awesome knight, or these sneaky archer guys. I freaking love them. Secondly, this game puts you in the driver's seat in a meaningful way. Admittedly, this is something less quantifiable than my other reasons for liking this game, but what I mean by this is that at any given decision-making point, there are numerous strategic options that are all valid for you to choose, and they are apparent. They're not hidden in a weird, obscurely written rule set that you only ever discover when someone uses them against you. They're out in the open. Now, this might slow your game down if you play with people who perform statistical analyses for every option in their head, like my friend Curtis. Hi, my name is Curtis, and this is true. But it makes the game feel like it has a ton of replay value trying out different decisions to see their outcomes. Additionally, the gameplay never feels incredibly bad. There's never a point in the game where you're like, All right, it all comes down to this singular dice roll, and if I fail, my game is ruined. Sure, there are dice, and sure, you can roll them badly. Believe me, I've rolled my fair share of ones when charging, but guess what? That doesn't mean my unit is just gonna stand there like a bunch of idiots and not charge. They still get the charge. They just lose the benefit that they would otherwise have had if they rolled a one, which is actually really annoying. To ensure that you don't immediately add to your backlog of shame by buying models for this game, let's cool off with an ad from this video's sponsor, Squarespace. 
Mini painting is a confusing hobby to a lot of my relatives, and with an online gallery like the one that I made on Squarespace's platform, I'm able to easily show my Aunt Gladys what it is I do exactly with these plastic toy soldiers. Personally, I'm all about finding the biggest bang for the littlest buck. In the case of making videos, it's how I make the highest quality product with the lowest time invested. Squarespace gets you the highest quality website with lowest time investment, leveraging their awesome templates. Maybe you don't need an online gallery, but prefer to write your battle reports on a slick website. Maybe those bat reps are restricted to paying audience members, which you can implement with Squarespace's members area. Whatever your idea, head to squarespace.com slash miniac to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain using the code miniac. All right, let's get back to the video with number three. The third thing that captured my attention was the movement trays. Yeah. Empty bottles of red wine laying on the floor from last night. We got a little drunk. Yeah. Now on a more serious note, rank and flank miniature war games imply something about how the game operates. It means your units can't see everything and just gravitate toward the closest enemy. It places way more emphasis on the movement and deployment in the game. There are so many other factors to consider other than just how close am I to the enemy or am I in cover. You might place a tray of units further forward that can take a beating so that if they get charged, the enemy that charged them exposes their flank. You might position a unit on an angle who has a good fleeing mechanic so that when an enemy engages them and you leave, you're exposing an enemy's flank. You might position your units in a line to prevent faster enemies from hitting your flank. There's a lot of flank strategies going on here. Are you following me? Fourthly, the game introduces a wonderful new idea called a tactics board. This element of the game represents your more political allies and how they affect the larger scope of the war outside of your individual battle. Your army is made up of combat units, attachments, or just heroes, a single commander, and non-combat units, or NCUs. An acronym that is a lot easier to say than ASOYF. God damn it! These units can be placed on the tactics board during your turn to get extra stuff like allowing a unit to attack again or move again, among other benefits. You will often have to think about what your opponent might want to do and block that. Now you may ask, But Scott, how can I block my opponent's board when he goes before me? Well, young gamer Padawan, this game has a little feature called alternating activations. A fresh new gaming feature that also exists in debatably the world's greatest board game, chess. You know that game that's like 1500 years old? Disclaimer, I'm not actually super into chess, I'm just using its prestige to strengthen my point. Coming in at the fifth reason to love this game is that you and your opponent alternate activating your models. It feels so incredibly good to play a miniature war game with alternating activations. Instead of waiting for your opponent to do literally everything with their 80 count model army, you only wait for him to do things with 10 of them. Instead of there being an incredible emphasis on who goes first in any given turn, there's less emphasis, meaning it becomes another strategic consideration among many others to consider when commanding your army. Alternating activation cultivates a greater sensation of pushing and pulling in this game. Small gains and small losses. <laughs> Lastly, this game has rekindled the love I once had as a 12 year old for this hobby. This is a little sad to admit, but for the first time in I can't remember how long, I sat down to paint a miniature with no intent, no cameras, no live stream, no purpose other than just to paint minis for my army. And I was happy all the way through. If there was nothing else in this video other than that last detail, this game would be worth it for me. One last honorable mention. The company that owns the license for creating a Song of Ice and Fire models is Dark Sword Miniatures. Simon, another acronym that's easier to say than A-S-O-I-A-F, got it! The creator and publisher of this game had to collaborate with Dark Sword Miniatures to create this miniature war game. It just so happens that Dark Sword Miniatures is local to my area and the owner spectated one of my games I was playing recently and I feel like a little giddy geek, so let's kind of reel it in. Surely, however, with all those pros come some cons and you'd be right, so let's discuss some of those. The casting on the models is not the greatest. If you're familiar with Simon's plastic, you'll be familiar with the level of detail on these minis. Additionally, the plastic is rubbery and difficult to clean up for the most part. The weapons are actually cast in a harder plastic, which makes cleaning up the mold lines a lot easier. Simon, ever heard of CO cast? I'm sure you have, get on it. Some of these sculpts deserve beautiful castings. 
Other hobby complaints might be that the models are attached to their bases, which makes it hard to base them if you want to do something a little bit extra special without removing the models first. A lot of the units in the various armies share special rules and features. Do you need a unit that's tanky? Everyone has those. Do you need a unit that's kind of faster? We got that. Do you need to deal with armor? Tick. The effect of this is that the armies can tend to feel a little similar. The newest faction, however, House Greyjoy, has a mechanic that is solely unique to them, though. So I think Simon might be aware of this trend and is trying to buck it. Is that how you use that phrase? Lastly, the game has a tactics deck that is 20 cards in size that introduces a lot of really interesting mechanics during the battle, but you rarely ever get through all 20. Those are all the pros and cons of A Song of Ice and Fire that I know of, and that's it for this video, guys. I don't often talk about gaming, but I'm just so into this game at the moment that it kind of felt right. As a YouTuber with a larger audience, I am incredibly stingy with how I advertise products. I rarely ever make a video about one sole product. It's more often a comparison between various products that are similar. Simon isn't sponsoring this video. These are entirely my own opinions. If you like me talking about gaming, consider watching the Kill Your Friends episode where I'm playing another game that I'm very fond of, Guild Ball. If you're new here and have any interest in the hobby, I'll be running a Kickstarter campaign soon. And if you wanna get updates about the progress of that campaign, sign up for the mailing list that I have linked in the description. That's gonna do it for this one, guys. If you like the channel and you wanna support it, there are a number of ways that you can do it, namely a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, like a Discord server where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about your miniature painting projects or what miniature working that you're currently into. You can also buy my model, the Duchess, or buy hobby gear that I recommend. All things linked in the description below. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to pay my medals!